two programs tonight marking the 10th anniversary of the first moon landing. James Burke looks back at Project Apollo and the men who walked on the moon. Okay, our flight controllers went auto sequence, stand by. CDR panel 325, primary glycol to rad valve, pull the bypass. ECS on the Roger. S2, pre-press complete flight. Roger. CDR and LMP, panel 6 and 9, pat bomb off. Bad kind of going on. Roger, Dad. Dad and my bad guy going off, sir. It's been a nice smooth countdown, sir. Oh, thank you, babe. Nine. Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Time uh, during the flight, an exciting uh, portion of the trajectory was the descent to the lunar surface. It was the most demanding, the systems were the most heavily loaded, there were the largest number of unknowns, uh, things were being taxed to the limit, uh, and uh, it was uh, most challenging from a personal standpoint. That is the moment when the lunar module pitches forward from its basically uh, eyes out, back down attitude, uh, and you view the surface out the window directly for the first time, and realize that after having gone a quarter million miles, you are in fact within uh, a kilometer of your objective, that you are in the control, uh, you are going to be able to land it because you've done it thousands of times and, and uh, I'll never forget that moment. There's absolutely no question about it. It's, it's bland in color, it's, it's dark, there's no trees, there's, it's very difficult to judge. No, but Gene, it's like, being, it's like being in a sharply defined charcoal painting. It's a magnificent charcoal I use the word majestic. It had a majestic beauty. I don't think I've ever... It's not bland. I disagree. No, it has been called bland. I didn't call it bland. It has been called bland, but to me it is not. Ten years ago, Apollo reached its climax with a landing on the moon. It was a kind of tremendous enterprise that will very probably not happen again in our lifetime. This program is a celebration of that enterprise. succeeded and two failed in attempting to reach the lunar surface on board their tiny spaceship, the fragile, glittering machine known as the lunar module, the LEM.
Apollo started home on the 19th of December 1972, only two and a half years after manned lunar exploration had begun. Today, much of the talent and expertise that made Apollo possible is dispersed throughout America. Most of the astronauts, too, have left. Neil Armstrong, for instance, and Buzz Aldrin, his fellow crewman on the first landing. Armstrong is now a professor of aeronautical engineering at Cincinnati University, where he retired in 1971, away from public gaze except for a brief appearance in Chrysler commercials. Buzz Aldrin, with an engineering consultancy in Los Angeles, suffers from bouts of alcoholic depression. Pete Conrad works for McDonnell Douglas Aircraft and does advertisements for one of their subcontracting companies. Al Bean, still with NASA, training astronauts for the shuttle. Admiral Al Shepard was a millionaire while still an astronaut, now sells beer. Ed Mitchell experiments with telepathy and runs a business. Jim Irwin got religion on his flight and is now an evangelist. John Young, still with NASA, chief astronaut and commander of the first shuttle. Dave Scott is a high technology consultant with his own business. Charlie Duke sells property in a small town in central Texas. Gene Cernan's the vice president of an oil company. And Jack Schmidt, the only geologist to fly to the moon, is now actively lobbying for space as a US senator. The majority of them have been thinking about this for years. These last four men, together with two other key men in Apollo, Jim Lovell, commander of the only flight that failed to get there, and ex-astronaut and administrator, Jim McDivitt, got together in a Houston hotel specially for this program. And I asked them about the image NASA projected of them in the old days. Most of the people have come up to you and said, gee, it's really nice to know that, that you're just an average guy, you know, that you put your pants on one leg at a time, because the, first off, you you go into a meeting or uh, an audience and they expect you to float in in your spacesuit and land on the stage and when you especially a young kid yeah. and if you don't do that uh, it's almost boo hiss get off the stage you're a fake don't you do that every time no i tried a couple a of times <laughs> what, what, is, what is this That's one thing projected the uh, all-american boy image uh, clean cut and uh, and I think at the time it was necessary. Uh, I mean, it, it showed it, it had a new hero worship in uh, in the country at a time when uh, weren't, weren't you that image? <laughs> well, I faked it. <laughs> but no, it, 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 seriously, it, it, it brought some new hero worship at a time when I think this country needed it. Uh, well, look at the period. That's an excellent point. Look at the period in which all this was happening. Mm -hmm. You know, the late, late 60s late and 60s. early 70s. And for crying yeah, out loud, yeah. look at what else was happening. There was Vietnam. There was the student problems on the campuses. And, and a lot of other things where really the major positive thing happening in this country and maybe in the world was space. Rarely, if ever, has any group of individuals captured the public imagination more than did these men, at least up until public interest began to wane after the first landing. They were, as Jim Lovell said, portrayed as clean living, all American boys. But there was always a touch of the Superman about them. True? Back in December 1958, if you had wanted to be an astronaut, the announcement made it sound simple. Basic requirements, age between 25 and 40, under 5 foot 11, it was going to be a small spacecraft, science degree qualifications, qualified jet test pilot, healthy, experience in dangerous and stressful situations. They were thinking of people like balloonists, Arctic explorers, mountain climbers and such, but the White House was thinking of national security and said you stick to the military. But you might still have qualified. Let me go on. The selectors also said that they were looking for high intelligence, ability to command, ability to take orders, motivation, creativity, mathematical ability, sociability, adaptability, maturity, decency, psychological stability. Could you sit absolutely still in a dangerous situation? How are you doing so far? But then, candidates, and there were 508 of them, had to go through exhaustive interviews in Washington, followed by every known medical test, including sperm count, at the interestingly named Lovelace Clinic in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Well, that cut them down to 31. And then it was off to secret midnight rendezvous in groups of five in Dayton, Ohio, for what was known as stress testing. Now when I look past on, back on it, it was very idiotic. Uh, some of the tests were still being devised as we went through. The whirling you around in all sorts of directions, anybody would get sick. They also dropped them, spun them, heated them, tilted them, made them run on treadmills, and vibrated them until they indicated that they'd had enough.
at which point they took them off to further forms of torture. Uh, the, your foot was in a bucket of ice water. Uh, there was a f flash of light in your eye, very painful. You spent 10 hours in a darkened room. Uh, some of the stuff today, uh, we realize, was unnecessary. I, I think, though, that the doctors didn't know what the people would get into in space, and so they were trying to make sure that whoever they selected was immune to just about anything. And all the time, the psychiatrists were saying things like, please give 20 answers to the question, who am I? Could you have done that? Never mind the rest. Well, they had a very in-depth aptitude test, uh, things that all aptitude tests have. Do you love your mother and things of this nature? Uh, the Rorschach test, you recall those. We look at ink blots and uh, uh, what, are, what do you see there? Well, in our second selection of the Gemini program, Al Shepard sort of warned us about this. He said, now be sure that you give the proper answers because make sure that you are masculine enough otherwise you'll be eliminated from the program and of course he was saying this in tongue-in-cheek but we all took him seriously so when all the ink blots came up we we looked at him and sure enough we'd always see some feminine anatomy in there to make sure that we gave the proper sexual response you know? I don't even know anything about it. what none of our seven new heroes realized was that anybody who failed any test for psychological reasons however slight would have been out well, as somebody said at the time, once you've chosen your Superman, that only leaves you about 10,000 other problems to solve. Let's take a look at some of the major ones. Not least, how do you get men to the moon? The trouble with that is what goes up tends to come down. Now, at the time, they were doing a bigger version of that with intercontinental ballistic missiles, which is why they thought they could go to the moon at all. All they had to do was to stop the rocket falling back to Earth. And that's where the idea of an orbit comes in. If you fire with sufficient power, the rocket will come down halfway across the world, but at an angle. Reach a speed of over 17,000 miles an hour, and the rocket will fall, but miss the Earth and go on missing it like this. Next, you boost your speed to over 25,000 miles an hour, and the rocket will follow a new orbit, still trying to fall to Earth, but going out over 250,000 miles into space before doing so, like this. If the rocket's intercepted at this point by the moon, then the moon's gravitational field will attract the rocket just enough to change its orbit, swing it round the back of the moon, and head to Earth. A touch on the brake pedal, as it were, at the right moment, and you stay in orbit round the moon. Another touch, and you land. All you have to have to be able to do that is one of these, a Saturn V. And that is your next major problem. How do you build one of these monsters safe enough and accurate enough to risk putting men on top and shooting them at the moon? Well, the answer to that question is that you give it to many different people to each build and test one part. The figures on the Saturn V were astronomical. This first stage, made by Boeing, carried 530,000 gallons of fuel and accelerated to 6,000 miles an hour in two and a half minutes. Stage 2, built by North American Aviation, increased the speed to over 15,000 miles an hour and went up to 600,000 feet. The third stage, built by McDonnell Douglas, would eventually take a speed up to 25,000 miles an hour, escape velocity. With the housing for the lunar module, the mother spacecraft and the launch escape tower, the whole stack reached a mind-boggling 363 feet end to end. The secret of Saturn's success was to test fly everything at once. Something of a gamble when you think how hard it was to guide even the small early rockets. And by Apollo time, the engines were bigger and the rocket bodies themselves made of much thinner metal. Launch had to be absolutely right. If there's the slightest wobble, the speed simply tears the thing apart like this. Von Braun solved the wobble problem by the hair-raising expedient of giving Saturn the ability to change its direction of thrust, because the five one-and-a-half million pound thrust engines were actually movable. At that uh, moment of liftoff, when things are just starting, you've got all your pumps, so you've got that large thrust build-up, you've got this 
really birth going on at that time. It's the moment of birth because a space vehicle comes to life and lifts off. It's on its own. Apollo 16 astronaut Charlie Duke calls riding Saturn through separation the train crash. And then as you accelerated up to shutdown, you were four and a half G's pushing you back into the seat. And then the engines, whoop, they shut down instantly and bang, it felt like the thing came apart. And it, it wong like that and everything flew up and uh, the cloud came by the, the window of the spacecraft. And to me, that was a, that was a train wreck. So the next problem, getting a big enough push to go to the moon, was solved. Launch was hairy, but never during the event itself. It's a bit like an operating table. Uh, you don't want the surgeon ever getting mad while he's running the operation. But after the operation, I'll say there was a woodshed. In fact, the fellows called it Rocco's Woodshed that uh, we did uh, go to occasionally and have a few words, but not in the fire room. Next problem, how you get the crew to the moon and back, was solved by this the command module with the cylindrical service module behind it. Take a look around the command module. Rather small for three men for nearly ten days, isn't it? Three couches with the one in the middle usually folded away for extra space. You flew the spacecraft, you sat here. In this control, how much power do you want? And with this one, which way do you want to go? Ahead of you, the control panel. Which way up are you? Computer, engines, fuel tanks, and up here, the warning lights. So, here you are in your spacecraft. But where is here? That's the next major problem, navigation. Most of the time, the big tracking stations on Earth would work out how long it took a radio signal to get back to them from the spacecraft and use that information to work out whereabouts in space the Apollo was. But, in here, if anything goes wrong, you're on your own. And that's where this comes in. See how a gyro stays the same way up, whatever else moves? Now, you put three gyros spinning and sitting still, like that, like that, and like that, and they will sense the spacecraft moving around them and tell the computer. And so will three accelerometers that sense thrust, like the way you know your head jerks back when a car accelerates. Now the computer's got a clock, so it knows we're going in this direction, we're going this fast in this direction, and we've been doing it for X hours or minutes. And it can use that to work out where the spacecraft is, roughly. For the really fine detail, you use these things, a telescope and a sextant. You point the spacecraft so that through the sextant you see, say, Miami. Then you ask the computer to find you a particular star, and as it's hunting for the star with the telescope, it also tilts a little mirror back on the sextant at the same time. OK, here's the star in the telescope. Centre it up. When you go back to the sextant, the star's also in the sextant's tilted mirror. And because of the optics, it's superimposed on Miami. The angle of the sextant's little mirror is the angle between the star and Miami. Put that angle into the computer. So, you've got this angle. Do it again to another star and Miami. Now, there are several places in space where you'd get those particular angle relationships. But since the computer already knows approximately where you are, it knows which of those positions you're not at, leaving only the one you are at. And that's how you get a fix in space. Looks easy? Uh-uh. Urine blobs look like stars, which is why position remarks like the following one are so vague. This is coming to you approximately halfway between the moon and the Earth. That was the voice of Jim Lovell on board Apollo 8, together with Commander Frank Borman and Lunar Module Pilot Bill Anders on their historic first flight out to the moon in December 1968. The first time men had crossed the frightening, airless void between the planets and looked back at the fragile beauty of Mother Earth. Sure, the Earth. It's a beautiful, beautiful view. 
with a predominantly blue background and uh, just... On Christmas Eve, they reach the moon. We've got it, Apollo uh, 8 now in, in lunar orbit. Uh, there's a cheer in the, this room. Jim Lovell's work on Apollo 8 made navigation that bit easier for the flights that followed. Although, as he himself says, things went so well, he nearly blew the mission. One day on the way home, after we had gone around the moon and were sort of relaxed, I got a little careless. And I started to use the program to start navigating, and I accidentally put in the wrong program, which actually put me back on the launch pad. I lost all reference of our position in space, our attitude. Uh, this was not to be in the plan of the flight. Uh, uh, they, you know, we, were, we wanted to keep everything going. This was the very first flight, and naturally we didn't want to lose our reference because we could not make that safe entry back home again. And so everybody was quite concerned until I manually looked around the sky and found three stars that I recognized since the computer could not tell me any longer what star was which. And I then did a manual uh, alignment of the platform and from then on we were back in good shape again. The next problem to solve was this. How the lunar module coming up from the moon's surface would find the command module after a 60 mile ascent and go through the complex maneuvers of matching position and speed accurately enough to make this last movement, which is speeded up on the film, with the kind of precision needed to hit the docking target dead on. Tell you what we have captured? There we go. We were there. This is why that's not at all as easy as it looks. Suppose you're in the lunar module, trailing the command module at the same speed, in the same orbit. To catch him up, you fire your engine. Wrong. That puts you into a higher orbit than him, and higher orbits are slower orbits. Perversely, you should have done exactly the opposite. Fired your engine as if to go directly away from him. That drops you into a lower orbit, and lower orbits are faster. So you catch up. As you arrive alongside the command module, you are of course below. So docking involves a number of very delicate mini-maneuvers, many of which are the opposite of what you think you should do. In March 1969, Jim McDivitt, Dave Scott and Rusty Swikert flew Apollo 9 in Earth orbit to test, for the first time, the lunar module's ability to carry out a rendezvous. Two months later, NASA was ready to try it in lunar orbit. Uh, Roger, Houston, Apollo 10, you can tell the world that we have arrived. Stafford and Cernan took the lunar module down to 50,000 feet. Oh, Houston, Houston, this is Snoopy. Right, Snoop, go ahead. It's going, we is down among us, Charlie. Roger, I hear you weaving your way up the freeway. Uh, it was on the way back up that the near disaster occurred. The backup autopilot on board was designed to cut in, if the primary system failed, to take the ship straight towards the command module from wherever it was. As they were on a smooth, curving climb towards the mothership, that backup system did cut in, unexpectedly, and the language went very untechnical. Next time you want to go... The way the map is set for a light vehicle. We'll do it this way. Okay, you ready? Son of a bitch. Charlie Brown, uh, Houston, they got hey, saving. Uh, they uh, had a wild uh, gyration, though, but they got it under control. Over. Moving just one switch on the guidance control panel in the lunar module, like that, caused the problem. Because although the lunar module computer will take you all the way up to rendezvous, or all the way down to the surface of the moon by itself, it will only do that if all the switches are in the right position, so that it's being told what it needs to know. And as you can see, there are a lot of switches to get in the right position. 
You can, of course, fly the Lem yourself if you want to, using these two controls. Then the main displays, the computer, which way up are you, how much fuel have you got left, and the one everybody wants to see light up very gently, that one, the lunar contact light. As you come in over 500 feet, the job is to find somewhere smooth to set down and land on. The commander has two minutes to do that before he runs out of fuel. So he is looking out of the window as if his life depended on it, which it does. And the lunar module pilot is telling him all he needs to know from that display there, which says you're going forward or sideways at a certain number of feet per second, and this display here that says you're going up or down at so many feet per second. So he's calling out things like 200 feet, forward at eight, down at five. The name of the game, of course, is to land on the surface of the moon going forward or sideways at naught and downwards at a very small number. Looks easy. But as we watch the landing of Apollo 11, remember what I said about getting the switches in the right position. 50 down at two and a half. 19 forward. Three and a half down, 220 feet. 13 forward. 11 forward, coming down nicely, 200 feet. Four and a half down. Five and a half down. Let's just uh, stop the landing there for a minute while I tell you about all the other people who were doing it too. The people the crew were calling Houston. There were about 70 of them and they were split into four shifts. Their average age was under 30 and this was their office. The Mission Operations Control Room. Here's what everybody did. Guido, the Guidance and Navigation Officer. Remember him, you'll be meeting one. Fido, every spacecraft maneuver was his responsibility. Retro, bringing them back safely to Earth. Here, the flight surgeon. Here, the capsule communicator, the astronaut in constant contact with the crew. And over here, two sets of engineers. One set watching all the systems on board the command module, the other watching all the systems on board the lunar module, and everybody watching very carefully. Up here, the hot seat. The flight director. The boss. Now, while all you and I heard during the mission was the capsule communicator talking to the crew, in here, Everybody was talking to everybody else on their own internal communications network called the Flight Director's Loop. Listen to what the landing was like on that. Got us locked up there, telecom. Okay, it's just real weak flight. Okay, how are you looking? All your systems go? That's a firm flight. How about you, Control? We look good. Guidance, you have any go, go, Fido, how about you? We're good. Uh, uh, you can be well, we are, right, right, no problem. Right. The Flight Director in charge, whose voice you heard there, was Gene Krantz. We came on board about 8 o'clock in the morning of July 20th. And uh, it was sort of like you were uh, all set up for a big game. Uh, I think everyone had the sweaty palms. They were sort of nervous. We checked in with the other controllers uh, to more or less get the status of the uh, overall spacecraft. And it looked like uh, everything was going great for us. And as soon as the spacecraft came over, the first thing that uh, we noted was that our communications were very ratty. They were poor. They, they were dropping in and out. And it seemed that it took that initial problem to sort of mobilize the team to more or less the frame of mind, hey, this is just another training exercise. We got problems. That's what we're trained to work on. So let's have at it. This is the guidance officer I said you'd meet, Steve Bales. He was monitoring navigation and therefore any navigational involvement on the part of Apollo's computer. Unfortunately, we had started the limb guidance computer off with a navigational error. It was approximately 14 miles an hour. What that means is the guidance computer thinks that it is going toward the moon 14 miles an hour slower than it really is. The only thing that could save the situation was an update from the landing radar, telling the onboard computer that it was wrong. The astronauts could do nothing to help. Radar flight looks good. Raj, 10%. Raj, 2,000. Good luck on. At that point, I started to relax a little bit because the worst problem I thought we could ever have in a landing was a navigation problem. Just 20 seconds after we had started to correct the state vector error, first program alarm occurred. 1202 12 alarm. Flight retro. Go retro. Throttle down. 6 plus 2 Give five. us a reading on the 1202 12 program five. alarm. That means the computer was too overloaded to do everything it was supposed to. Bales had 20 seconds. If in that time the computer stopped navigating, or there was one more alarm, he'd have to cancel the landing immediately. We're, we're going Roger. that flight. We're going that alarm. Roger, we got you. We're it's, going it's that alarm. Will be go. He's, Roger. he's taking in a Delta H now. Roger. Roger. 330. Did you get the throttle down? 5, throttle down. 6.25, throttle down. 
Were you scared? Scared absolutely to death, but I was not as scared during the alarms as I was when we started the landing. What we had to do is to make sure that if for any reason we would have an accident during the actual landing phase that we had the information to tell us why the accident occurred. So the communications and in fact the telemetry were extremely important. What you're actually saying is that if people died, you had to know why. We have to know why. That is, that is absolutely correct. Okay, we've still got landing radar guidance. Confirm. Okay, is it converged? Oh, it's beautiful. Has it converged? Yes. Okay. Okay, all flight controllers, go now, go for landing. Retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. Control. Go. Go. GNC. Go. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Eagle, Houston, you're go for landing. Over. 1201. Roger, 1201 alarm. 1201 alarm. Same type, we're go flight. We're go. Same type, we're go. Got this battle up there. One of the major problems caused by the five computer emergencies during descent was that the crew were able to look out and see where they were only in the last few minutes. So they weren't exactly happy. We were uh, certainly aware of some of the problems. We knew we had a tight fuel budget. Uh, we didn't know the computer was going to act up on us as it did. The alarms had occurred because a rendezvous radar switch had been left on, flooding the computer with an overload of data it didn't even need during the landing. A switch was in a place that we told the crew to put it. We had not been super smart. If we'd have been super smart in the two or three months before the landing and have thought about this circuit and have thought about what the possible implications might be, then we'd have caught it. Forward. At 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. Straight shadow. Down Four forward. 30. Four forward, drift into the right a little. 30. 30. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. They had 30 seconds of fuel left. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. APA at a descent. Boat control, both auto descent, engine command override off. Engine arm off. 413 is in. We've had shut down. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, hey everybody, uh, T1, stand by for T1. Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. Roger, Twain. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue, we're breathing again, thanks a lot. The Eagle has landed, and I could see it here on my console. I saw the altitude go to zero, couldn't believe it. We trained, I said, my God, we've made it. Uh, Charlie Duke at the time says, you've got a bunch of guys down here about to turn blue. Well, Charlie Duke could see me from his console position, and I've always thought he was talking about me, but I always thought he said blue because Charlie couldn't say he's turned white as a sheet, which is the way I had turned, I assure you. Deke Slayton was flight director of flight operations at the time, and Deke was sitting right next to me as we were in the final stages of descent. Well, if they had you'd been there during the entire descent, and, uh, and we were uh, feeding the information back and forth, and it got down, I think, within a couple of hundred feet, and within a minute to go and they were still whizzing across the surface and uh, uh, and we were talking and all this information was coming in and I was trying to filter out and finally Deke hit me like that and he said shut up so I uh, got quiet and uh, we just watched then and uh, then they started on in and uh, and literally I was holding my breath I can remember I personally was and they touched down within 15 seconds of an abort uh, situation or maybe 20 I've forgotten exactly but it was close and uh, at that point uh, we were, the Eagle has landed uh, and uh, great we I forgot what I said exactly but we got a bunch of guys about to turn blue we're breathing again and uh, I know I really was and it was so <laughs> tense at that point but the people up in the viewing room and our training areas you could hear them cheering through the glass walls in the room here and that took a few seconds to sink in. And then the thing that we had to do is get back to business again, because we had to make sure that we were not only down, but we hadn't sprung any leaks on any of our propellants. So we had to start a countdown to two possible abort times. We had to change the computer modes. And everyone was, was locked up emotionally. I remember I was holding on to the, in the last minute or so, I was holding on to the handle on this TV here and I, I just didn't let go and I had to change communications loops and I couldn't talk and finally I just got so frustrated with myself that I took and I hit my hand on the console and it, it shocked me back to life and, and for days I was bruised from the wrist all the way to the elbow. Okay, T1, stay no stay, retro. 
Stay. Fido. Stay. Guide. Stay. Control. Stay. Calcom. Stay. GNC. Stay. Econ. Stay. Surgeon. Stay. Capcom, we're stay for T1. Go Eagle, control. you're we're stay for T1. Just before 4 a.m. our time on July the 21st, Armstrong climbed down the lunar module's ladder. I'm uh, at the foot of the ladder. The lamb footbeds are only uh, uh, depressed in the surface about uh, one or two inches. Uh, although the surface appears to be uh, very, very fine-grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. I'm going to step off the lamb now. That's one small step for man. This was the next major problem for the Apollo missions, how to survive on the moon. The individually tailored spacesuits consisted of helmet and gold-tinted visor to protect the eyes, a one-piece suit for protection against micrometeorites, and a backpack for carrying oxygen and cooling water. Without a suit on the moon, you lost less than a second. Fortunately for NASA, everything appeared to work perfectly. Yes, indeed. They've got the flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes on the lunar surface. Beautiful, just beautiful. These pictures of ghost-like astronauts held the entire world in thrall for two hours. Maybe partly because they were so imperfect, they added to the mystery. Uh, Neil and Buzz, uh, the President of the United States, like to say a few words to you. The trouble was, everything else seemed to go so well, it all looked easy. Not long after this great day, the world became bored by space. Four months later, Apollo 12 did little to help by breaking their TV camera, ensuring no audience at all for the mission. And in April 1970, when Apollo 13 lifted off, few people in America bothered to watch. Over two days into the flight, the crew, Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes and Jack Swigert, had just fired the engine to alter their trajectory such that if anything went wrong, they could no longer just swing round the moon and come back. But what could go wrong? Far off in the distance now, you can see the uh, the objective. It's actually uh, beginning to look a little bigger now. Uh, uh, you can see quite distinctly. Uh, some the Americans were so blasé that the only people watching that nine o'clock in the evening Apollo broadcast were the Houston controllers. What nobody knew was that another switch was in the wrong position, and this time it couldn't be fixed by the astronauts, even if they'd known. Rigging is hammock for sleep on the lunar surface now to try it out to see. Ignorant of what was to come, Roger, they said goodnight. Good this is the crew of Apollo 13, which everybody there, uh, nice evening, and uh, we're just about ready to close out our inspection of Aquarius and get back for a pleasant evening at Odyssey. Good night. 13, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like it to uh, stir up your cryo tanks. Okay, stand by. That request to stir up your cryo tanks was quite reasonable. Cryo means cryogenic, and that refers to the tanks of supercold liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen they carry on board to make water and electricity. Now, they'd been having trouble getting a reading on that oxygen tank, and they'd been getting a low pressure reading on that hydrogen tank, and they thought if they stirred up the fans inside the tanks, that would stir up the liquid and make it easier to get an accurate reading on the gauges. So, Jack Swigert, sitting here where I am, turned the fans on. 40 seconds later, the spacecraft shook, and that light came on, and so did that one. Okay, Houston, uh, Houston. we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Yes, sir. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main B bus undervolt. Roger, main B undervolt. Okay, stand by, 13, we're looking at it. And before we could digest that, two more lights came on that said that two out of three of your fuel cells have died which then meant, according to our mission rules, that we could not land on the moon, and there was a wave of disappointment that went through the spacecraft. And then, for some reason, I drifted over to the center of the spacecraft, and I looked at the instruments, and of the instruments that told me about the two big oxygen tanks in the back end of our spacecraft, one quantity gauge was zero, and the second one I could actually see go down, which normally you would never see in a normal flight. Of course, then I began to get quite worried. We are, uh, we are venting something out uh, into the uh, into space. Okay, let's everybody think of the kind of things we'd be venting. GNC, you got anything that looks abnormal in your system? Negative light. 
Okay, now let's everybody keep cool. We got the uh, limb still attached. Let's make sure we don't blow the whole mission. Network from flight. Flight network. Bring me up another computer in the RTCC, will you? Uh, we got uh, one machine on the RTCC and we got dual CP downstairs. Okay, I want another machine up in the RTCC and I want a bunch of guys capable of running D logs down there. Roger that. Flight Econ. Go ahead, Econ. The pressure in O2 tank one is all the way down to 297. We better think about getting in the LEM or using the LEM systems. The LEM was their only hope. At this point, they had just over two hours' supply of oxygen for breathing and for power left in the service module's ruptured tanks. And nobody yet knew how long the lunar module's supply would have to last. It would certainly only just be enough. Go ahead, Flight. I want you to get some guys figuring out minimum power in the LEM to sustain life. As the power dropped and the temperature fell, back at Houston, argument raged about what to do. It was too risky to fire the main engine in case it had been damaged by the explosion. They would have to go round the moon and come home burning the lunar module's engine and using its navigation systems, neither of which had ever been done before. Lovell's companions reacted strangely. I looked at my two companions and thinking that they were very much anxious to get home too and they both had cameras in their hands. And One fellow was looking at aperture settings and the other fellow was looking at uh, shutter speeds. And I said, gentlemen, what are your plans? We have to get home. We're going to have to speed up our, our burn and things of this nature. And they said, well, Jim, while we round the backside of the moon, we're going to take pictures. And I said, if we don't get home, you won't get them developed. <laughs> and, you know, they said, well, you know, you've been here before and we haven't. And doggone it. And we'd like to take some pictures of, you know, to show our folks back home. And so that's what they did. And perhaps uh, some of the finest pictures of the backside came out of that, that trip around. Jim, you are go for the burn. Go for the burn. Roger, right, understand. Go for the burn. Guidance okay? We're good, flight. Control okay? We're okay, flight. Tell me. We're go, flight. Inco okay? We're good, flight. Ground confirms ignition. We're burning 40%. Shut down. That engine burn had to be done manually. The computer wasn't programmed for this situation. Now, they had to set the spacecraft rolling to keep cool in the sunlight. And the lunar module had never done that before either. As some snatched fitful sleep, up came the next bit of bad news. The engine burn they'd completed had placed them on a trajectory aiming for Earth, but not aiming at it accurately enough to come back to Earth alive. Now that, that didn't sound too good either. And the ground confirmed that uh, about two hours after we had turned around the moon on our way home. They said, we have been tracking you. Uh, and it appears right now that you'll miss the Earth, the Earth's atmosphere by about 56 nautical miles. Somehow Houston had to correct that error while saving fuel and power and still set Apollo 13 up for the last major problem facing every moon flight, that of re-entry. Hit the atmosphere too shallow and you skip out like a stone. Come in too steep and you burn up. The entry angle difference between having this happen at 24,000 miles an hour and safety is two degrees. Get it right and you come streaking in like this. By the time the flight was entering the atmosphere, they'd got their audience back. Once again, the world watched Apollo with bated breath. If their heat shield had been damaged by the explosion, they wouldn't survive. After nearly five minutes of agonizing radio silence, Apollo 13 made contact. They were alive. Odyssey Houston, we show you on the mains. It really looks great. Houston had proved that when faced with an entirely unpredicted situation, they could, if necessary, rewrite the book as they went along. However, behind all the congratulations and applause, NASA was worried. The agency couldn't afford to be on the front page for this kind of reason. They had to find out why it had happened. The entire side of the spacecraft had been blown away, and a reconstruction of the events showed how the exploding oxygen tank had ripped the metal like tissue paper. Why it had exploded turned out to be appallingly simple. The tank contained a thermostat switch designed to stop the tank temperature rising too high. 
because nobody realised the test voltages had been increased at Cape Kennedy. One such test months before had welded the switch shut. Five months after Apollo 13 came home, NASA had only four more missions left instead of seven, thanks to budget cuts. And with only four places to go here, how do you choose? Well, Apollo 12 had shown that you can land within 500 feet of a target in relative safety, and that means you can go into the mountains. Now, the reason you want to go there is because on the moon, the mountains are either original surface material undisturbed, or they're giant bits of stuff thrown out from the interior because of meteor impact, or they're volcanoes. All three of which will tell you something about how old the moon is, what it's made of, and what's happened during its history. So, principally for those reasons, they decided to go for the last three super scientific missions, 15, 16, and 17, like this. 15 here, very high, old mountains, and a rill or valley that might have been formed by flowing lava. 16 here, deep in the mountains. They hoped for evidence of volcanic activity there. And 17, the most varied and interesting site of all, and the most difficult to get to, which is why they kept it till last. Here they hoped for both evidence of young volcanic activity and very old mountains, a very mixed site. But in January 1971, the next mission, Apollo 14, was targeted here to the Fra Mauro formation. Now that looked as if it had originally come from here. This giant basin called Imbrium formed when a gigantic meteorite had struck the moon, throwing out material from maybe a hundred miles deep to fly out and fall here. Apollo 14 landed on that stuff. This was what the place looked like. Touchdown had been perfect with over a minute of fuel left. However, the commander, Al Shepard, had landed on what appeared to be a slope. And later... In the middle of the night, with the window shades up, totally black inside, and not sleeping very well, as we discussed before. Some little valve in the air conditioning system went off and uh, woke both of us up. And I whispered uh, at first to Mitchell, I said, are you awake? And he said, hell yes, I'm awake. And I said, did you hear that? He said, hell yes, I heard that. And we discussed it for a while. Not, And we finally said, do you don't suppose that that thing is tipping over? It's sliding down in the dust and it's tipping over. We know the manufacturer guaranteed it would go to 15 degrees before it fell over. But, you know, maybe uh, the manufacturer was in the air by a few degrees. So we both leaped out of the... I fell on the head and we both scrambled for the windows. You know, what we would have done, I don't know, because everything was powered down at that particular time. And sure enough, there it sat at uh, five and a half or six degrees, just as serene as could be. But we didn't sleep anymore that night. <laughs> on 14's second moonwalk, they moved away from the LEM towards the 100-foot-high cone crater 5,000 feet away. Unfortunately, they and their handcart also moved away past the camera, so all you could do was listen to the steep climb. And the grade's getting pretty steep. And the uh, soil here is a bit firmer, I think, than we've been on before. Uh, they also couldn't make the rim of the crater. Our positions are all in doubt now, uh, Fredo. What we were looking at was a flank, but it's... It wasn't really, uh, the top of it wasn't the rim of cone. We got a ways to go yet. But the rim is uh, at least uh, 30 minutes away. Uh, Their heart rates shot up with the effort, and so did the rate they were using oxygen. And that takes precedence over all else. So they turned back short and headed for the lunar module. time in traverse if we don't. As I say, we didn't have an automobile, you know. It was in the days when we didn't have automobiles on the moon. We had to rest a couple more times than we'd figured going up there. And uh, another thing was discouraging about that also was the fact that the rim of that crater, as sharp as it had appeared in photographs, was really old to our eyes. And uh, it was very smooth. And we were, in fact, at the rim, although we didn't recognize it. And we st it's very difficult to judge distances. It's very difficult to see uh, the s smooth... Uh, a minor deviations, minor depressions. But that was the only time, really, that uh, we had to work awfully hard. Of course, we got it back going downhill because we were, we were really taking 12 league, uh, seven league steps. But I mean, I remember you were breathing like hell. Oh, yes, fortunately. <laughs>
The first of the super scientific missions, Apollo 15, was over the moon on July the 29th, 1971, with a redesigned spacecraft capable of doing lunar orbital experiments, as well as carrying double the previous payload down to the deep twisting valley called Hadley Rill, way down there below them. With time running out for Apollo, 15's commander Dave Scott was ready to take extra risks. Once you get that far and that close to your objective, uh, there would naturally be times during which uh, you would feel a desire to press on when perhaps Control Center might not. I, I didn't really find that in my mission, although we had, uh, just before we landed, uh, we did have a, a couple of short moments with our environmental control system on the lunar module, which didn't check out. And I can remember thinking to myself, well, what'll I do? Because you're so close. Fortunately, it checked out and I didn't have to make the decision. 15 landed at perhaps the most spectacular Apollo site, north of the 12,000-foot Mount Hadley Delta they'd flown over on the way down. On their first trip out from the lunar module, they ran into trouble. Drilling holes for the experiment measuring heat flow from the lunar interior, they hit hard rock. The effort caused Dave Scott to draw blood inside his gloves before giving up. And Dave, take a breather there. Yeah, it, it, uh, <laughs> it's tightening up again, Joe, and I'm not putting any force on it at all. It pulls itself down in, and then it starts to bind up. Dave, if you can tell, that drill really is going down. We're going to have to yeah. go about three more minutes and call it quits, probably. Setting up ALSEP, the surface experiments connected to their central transmitting station that all Apollos carried, took too long, thanks to the drilling problem, and cut down on the time they had for travelling around. And from this flight on, those traverses were to be much more ambitious, thanks to the fact that they now had their own transport, the Lunar Rover, capable of up to seven miles an hour. On 15, they were to cover a total of 15 miles on three traverses, and everywhere they went, the TV camera mounted on the Lunar Rover went to. On the second traverse, a surprise. Genesis Rock, Scott called it, wrongly hoping it would prove primeval. Traverse 3 took them west to the 1,200 foot deep rill. And I have the 500 out. And look at that rill. How about that? How about that geology fan? From the top of the rill down, there's uh, debris all the way, and it looks like uh, some outcrops directly at about 11 o'clock to the uh, sun line. It uh, looks like a layer, about 5% of the, uh, the real wall, and it's uh, somewhat irregular, but it looks to be a continuous layer. It may be uh, portions of, of uh, flows, after two stops on the rim of the valley, they headed back to the lunar module. For Houston, the first of the new super scientific missions had been a super scientific success. Then, with a feather and a hammer, Scott tested Galileo's theory that in a vacuum, gravity would cause all objects to fall at the same rate. For our Falcon, and I'll uh, drop the two of them here, and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Uh, Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. Okay, it's uh, August the 2nd, 1971. First and then came this event that was to end the careers of Scott and his companion Irwin. NASA had authorized cancellation of commemorative stamps on the moon. What they hadn't authorized were the extra 400 that got done for money back in the lunar module afterwards. The NASA image was tarnished, although by now people were beginning to realize the astronauts weren't the flawless automata NASA said they were. In April 72, when Apollo 16 landed, the crew got very expressive about the flatulence caused by a special potassium in orange juice diet taken to protect them from heart damage. I got the parts again. I got them again, Charlie. I don't know what the hell gives them to me. Certainly not. I think they had to spell it. I really do. I, mean, I haven't eaten this much citrus fruit in 20 years. And I'll tell you one thing, in another 12 fucking days, I ain't never eaten any more. And if they offer to sub me potassium with my breakfast, I'm going to throw up. 
John Young and Charlie Duke had landed in the Moon's Highlands at a site called Descartes, and with only one more flight to go, they were picking up every other rock. Oh, that's hot. Good, Good job. Thank you. Hey, that's a great rock. Look at that. Tony, I'm about uh, four or five meters away. Is that okay from that crater I described? That sounds good. Having failed to get the heat flow experiment set up on Apollo 15 because of the drilling difficulties, the Houston scientists were pinning their hopes on a more successful attempt to do the same thing here. On their first session out after landing, when they set up all the experiments, they found drilling the hole was a piece of cake. And then John Young walked across the heat flow experiment's cable. Up to B8. Okay. Right, between, right on the line between B7 and B8. Okay, Baker 7 and 8. The copy flight. Roger. Charlie, what? Something happened here. What happened? I don't know. Here's a line that pulled loose. Uh-oh. What is that? What line is it? That's the heat flow. You pulled it off. I don't know how that happened. Again, the lunar rover took them out on three traverses, over terrain much rougher than Apollo 15. On the last run, on the rim of a giant crater three miles to the north, they came across the biggest rock anybody would seen so far. That big black dot. Fantastic. Look at the size of that rock. We can see. The closer I get to it, the bigger it is. All right, fine. We've got an extension here, and uh, you got about 25 minutes. You get the tongs, uh, John? Yep. We got I'll carry the rake. <laughs> and as our crew slowly sinks, <laughs> <laughs> we bet the project disappeared into the sunset. Yeah, but look at the permanent shattered part, Charlie. On this side over here? Yeah. No, yeah. right here on this one. See that shadow? That must be permanent. No, I bet you it's not. The sun's going down over there, John. Yeah, you're right. See? Okay. And then, in December 1972, it was time for the last mission. At another landing site in the Highlands, the first and last qualified geologist to fly, Jack Schmidt, spent most of his vital few hours on the lunar surface sounding like a man who'd asked for the moon and after three years waiting got it i was strolling on the moon one day in, in a merry merry month of uh, december now, may 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 the month may, that's year. right <laughs> may is the year of the month when uh, much to my surprise a pair of bunny eyes do, 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 do. Do you see it, Bob? It's Gene Cernan was the commander of Apollo 17, and this time his heat flow drill worked both to make holes for the experiment and get tubes full of soil from below the surface. As for Jack Schmidt, well, he was so keen to get as much as possible out of being on the moon, he was falling over himself with eagerness. Hey, 
Dean, would you, help, would, would you go over and help Twinkle Toes, please, Dean? Really, I don't need any help, okay? Uh, Jack, you might uh, worry about whether bag. your uh, you might worry about whether your camera lens is dirty or clean, Jack. I don't know what you do about I'm it. I'm very worried about that. Then, on the way back to the lunar module from their second traverse, they came across something nobody had ever expected to see. There is orange soil. Get one of those. This, until they got back to Earth, looked like the most extraordinary find of all. Orange soil might indicate recent volcanic activity, or else it was evidence of water on the moon. Alas, neither turned out to be the case. But morale was still high as they swung back towards the lunar module at the end of their third traverse, the last traverse of all for the Apollo missions. Control, Telemium, GNC, Econ, Surgeon, ENCO, Procedures, FAO. Roger, we're go for lift off here, Capcom. After 74 hours, 59 minutes and 39 seconds on the lunar surface, on the 15th of December 1972, the last Apollo lifted off from the moon, ending less than three years of exploration, watched by the unemotional eye of the TV camera mounted on the lunar rover. Get the probe. Four more stage flight. Raj. 99, proceeded. Three, two, one. Ignition. Fly right away, Houston. That's your good. We're burning flat. Raj, how's the thrust? Looks good, flight. Positive Raj. H dot flight. Raj, plus H dot. Trust okay, Captain. Get over. over. That's here, you have good thrust. Okay, everybody, come on. Let's watch the TV here. Okay, we'll get the 30 seconds. What happened to our data? Your check, check, line check line out for 1,500 feet. It's Stop extraordinary over. how quickly Apollo and the astronauts have been forgotten when you think that only 12 men in the history of mankind have looked out across scenes like this. There's little doubt now that no one in our lifetime will stand again among the desolate mountains of the moon. We have decided that there are other, more urgent priorities. That's why, when I met the astronauts in Houston, I asked them the question no one who meets an astronaut can resist asking. What was it really like to be out there and look back at Earth? It's overpowering, I think. It, I don't, it didn't... I don't really think it changes you, it just gives you more philosophical outlook, at least it did me, uh, to be able to look across the poles and across the continents, across the oceans, realizing you're really looking at everything you can identify with, with home, with people, <coughs> with, with uh, humanity, with, with existence, and you can almost span times with one glance because you can look and watch the sunrise on, on one part of the, uh, of the world and almost see it set on the other, and you're spanning times of people. And, you know, it, without getting religious, uh, because it was not a religious experience for me, but it did bring back uh, one thing that I, I feel significant about, that the beauty and the logic and the purpose I saw of this beautiful, beautiful star in the heavens that didn't tumble or roll aimlessly, uh, it, it brought back to me something I probably believed all my life and just really thought about then, is it's just too beautiful and too perfect to have happened by accident. There has to be somebody or something that I don't understand. Religion, I believe, is man-made. I happen to believe they all get to the same place. That created that small part of the universe that, that a few of us were privileged to see. To me, it was incredibly beautiful. And it, none of the pictures that we sent back are published to do it justice. It's just jewel. But what was it, I mean, what was it like? Here I go, I'm doing it too. What was it really like? What was it really like? <laughs> <That's not laughs> <going on. laughs> no, look, nobody else but you people spent that much time, that close together in that smaller space except people who live in the front seat of a VW. <laughs> I mean, what was it like? Well, it was a challenge and it was an adventure that I think that none of us would ever trade. Uh, it was, uh, it's, it's really hard to explain. The well, emotional impact of being around the moon uh, and, and being there is, uh, is something... See, see, that's one of the things. People go to the Smithsonian or somewhere else or see pictures of the Apollo spacecraft, and it does look small. Yeah. But you go weightless in that spacecraft, and suddenly it's about double the useful volume because there's, there's no floor or ceiling or anything like that. And I actually felt, I don't know how Gino felt, but I felt like there were, there were certain times you could be private. You get under the couch, and, and you're, you're essentially alone. Have I'm you alone. ever felt being private with Frank Borman in Gemini? <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I was thinking. Well, I, think that, the, I think the guy the who has yeah. really something that's to talk right. about is being in... <laughs> And that Gemini for 14, 14 days. days. That's you level. Yeah. With Borman. <laughs> <laughs> we, have a, we have a relatively sophisticated audience, and so I don't feel being, I'm being too tacky if I say, what does that remind you of? <laughs> <laughs>
14 you days brought this up. Uh, that's the most common asked question we have. Well, well we could I would say it's the most common question everything. that people would like to ask. That's right. But have How do you go to the bathroom? Please, could you explain it? Oh, you're well, holding now, it long. Now, okay. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, this is, of course, the end, end result of a device of perhaps one of the most uh, difficult engineering uh, feats that NASA had to face. Finally, uh, I think it was uh, Jim McDivitt's flight in four days when they could no longer uh, ignore this problem. Up to that time, they could ignore it. But yeah. when Jim and Ed White went up for four days, obviously they had to do something. So it was given to John Young to, uh, to do the testing of this. They tried early ideas. They tried centrifugal force. That didn't work out too well. Uh, they tried magnetism in a, in a tube of some sort. That didn't work out. The iron filings got you know, <laughs> from the food that we had to eat. And uh, NASA went through a, quite a bit of engineering to finally evolve into this very simple, what we call, bag. Now, you can imagine, and let's set the scene. It's uh, five days into Gemini 7, and we're on 14 days, and I'm with Frank Borman, who's uh, very regular. <laughs> Uh, I have managed to hold Frank off for five days. Run out alone with you. Finally, <laughs> finally, Frank says, Jim, the time has come. And I said, Frank, we only have nine more days to go. I think that you can last a little bit longer. He says, no. And so he gets out one of these devices, and I look very pleasantly the other direction. And there is where we find out that in the space program, position is everything in life. <laughs> because if you don't position this thing correctly, we're all in deep trouble. <laughs> Uh, now, I, I don't want to go into details on this, Jim, but, uh, you know, there's zero gravity in space, and so you know, gravity does not help the things work. And so NASA has very conveniently put a little finger device in here to help things along. Now, also, we've been accused quite a bit of, uh, of spending too much money in the space program, and I want to let you know that we do not do that. This is what NASA has provided after everything is done. Uh, you know, I think in the airline industry you call them wet wipes or something like that, but I, it, you know, we are really saving money on this one. And finally, the Environmental Protection Agency will not allow us to throw anything over the side. And uh, so therefore, we have to uh, kill all the bacteria, otherwise, you know, three days from now we might have a serious explosion in the, the spacecraft. And so this blue material is a, is a disinfectant that will kill the bacterium. But what you have to do is to mix it thoroughly with the material inside. And you can imagine that, well, you really know if you have a good buddy or not. Uh, if you, after you're finished, you hand it to your, your flight mate and say, look, I'm busy over here. Would you need this for me? <laughs> Which Borman did to me that one time. <laughs> Yeah. I had a rumor that uh, that oxygen masks were terribly useful on occasions like that. They were, yeah. they were, uh, admittedly, they were used on Apollo 17. Well, see, the biggest Not, thing, the thing that Jim, I used one, you're lucky you didn't have to use it for the face. I used it to survive. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, Jim, you know, the most difficult part of it was detaching, <laughs> think we sticky yeah. I didn't material that, Jack, that was from the body, yeah. and, and, and particularly if there were, the number two was free floating. <laughs> And uh, that's when uh, you run the risk of number two hitting a fan in this, <laughs> <laughs> the circulation system. Now, what NASA had done, I think incorrectly in their engineering, they put a glue on here that was a little bit too, too gluey, too tight. And if you had uh, any amount of hair at all there, <laughs> you just about killed yourself trying to get rid of this thing. <laughs> but anyway, I think maybe, <laughs> thank you. Meanwhile. <laughs> Did any of you ever feel that you should have been given a small piece of moon rock? Every 200 million people in this country believe that we all were given moon rocks. They cannot believe that because you flew in space or you went to the moon, you don't have a moon rock. I don't have any feeling one way or the other. When I'm 99 years old, I would like to have a moon rock to give to my daughter. That won't occur, unfortunately. And I think it won't occur again because of NASA's concern over public opinion. Should they give a moon rock to a guy who went to the moon? Should they give him the watch he flew with to the moon? I don't know whether we should or not, so maybe we'll let him wear it for 50 years, but we won't give it to him. I had a five or six on my living room floor. When I, flying back, uh, these little things had been floating by, and I just pick them up and put them down on, and put them in my little ditty bag, and I got to keep my ditty bag, and I shook it out on the living room floor, and there was this, this pile of moon rocks, and I carefully put them in a little jar and take, took them down and turned them into the lunar receiving lab because it's like having a stolen Rembrandt. You know, who can you show it to? That's right. And, uh, and who will believe you? Yeah, who will believe you? Uh, I think it means more, 
I don't regret that I had, don't have one. I think my family does. Uh, it really meant a lot. Dottie could not believe it when I sent them, took them back. But uh, we well, don't have one, sure and I don't ever expect keep it. Keep one, Charlie. No. <laughs> well, we have Cross my heart. You sure? Cross my heart. Uh, never, uh, it, uh, but it, it doesn't mean anything to me. Now. I wondered what it was like for an astronaut to come back from the moon, from an experience he could never hope to repeat. Was it difficult to readjust? Al Shepard said it best. There was disappointment. I miss it. I still fly airplanes, which helps to a degree. But uh, I, I find plenty of challenges in the world today. Yeah, I was going to ask you, I mean, uh, this iron maturity, doesn't it crack sometimes at night when you stand out there and look up there? Oh, yes. I get misty-eyed, surely. There's uh, a lot of, uh, of feeling. It's a, a unique place, it's a far-off place, but yet to me it's very real. Mm. But I'm basically not uh, sentimental to the point where I'm going to feel badly about not having the opportunity to go again. If you look back at Apollo from the vantage point of ten years later, at the extraordinary feats of courage and engineering that NASA and those astronauts accomplished, one question stands out more than any other, and it's this. If landing on the moon gained America the admiration of the world, and the opinion polls say it did. If, in terms of exploration and the desire to unravel the secrets of the beginnings of the solar system, Apollo was a major step forward. If, at the most mundane level, Apollo was only the greatest adventure in the history of mankind, then why, today, in 1979, is the idea of sending men into deep space a dead duck? To say that it cost too much money is grossly to oversimplify the matter. It provided jobs for 400,000 people. In the same period, Americans spent more money on smoking. And anyway, to say that the money would have been better spent solving the problem of pollution or malnutrition or any of the other major social problems facing America is to presuppose that there existed at the time sufficient desire to use the money that way. And they didn't, or they would have. No, the death of Apollo was a much more complex and intriguing matter than that. It involved the political realities of the world outside the NASA monastery. It involved the Korean War. What going to the moon would do to the careers of Kennedy, Johnson and Nixon. The unnecessary death of three astronauts. The cost of the Vietnam War. Assassinations, race riots. And above all, whether or not Kennedy's original decision to go was still politically valid only two or three years after it was made. And the reason I am saying all this here at the Titusville Royal Oak Country Club, just a few miles from Cape Kennedy, is because the night before Apollo 11 went, the man who, perhaps more than anybody else, had made it possible for NASA to go to the moon by providing them with the giant rocket, Werner von Braun, helicoptered in here to a very private dinner party, at which he made an interesting statement of faith, only three years before the entire project was to be killed. At that dinner, he said this, if it had been our intention merely to go to the moon, bring back a handful of rocks and soil, and forget the entire enterprise, then we would certainly have been history's biggest fools. And yet that is exactly what they did. So were they fools? And if so, why? That's what we're going to be looking at in just over an hour from now on BBC Two in a program called The Other Side of the Moon. The story that people are willing to tell only now, ten years later, about why, in the case of Apollo, nothing failed like success. Hope you'll join us then.